Okay, well, let's start, start the meeting. Um, is everybody good with the minutes so we can do the minutes? I'm yes. abstaining. Because you weren't here. That's good. All right, so I guess minutes are approved. So we have a couple of adjustments to the agenda. So I think uh, Stacey's here. We, we will do those first. Um, some Lister. Errors or emissions or whatever? So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bradley, one of the Harvard listers. <coughs> um, so, yes, we're asking you to please approve an adjustment of 263200 to 255000 a reduction of 8200 on um, the account parcel ID 1635, um, Linda Temple at 514 Loop 5 uh, on the 2019 grand list. There were two items that the owner grieved during the grievance period, the open grievance hearings um, this year. Uh, the grievance was determined to be valid, but the corrections, um, unfortunately, we did not make them on the account before the grand list was lodged. So we're asking to be able to correct those two items. Specifically that we had um, two bathrooms listed on the property and there's only one and that there was some 384 square foot of finished rec room called rec room basement area and there isn't any. And um, so totaling the 8,200. It's called dressing up the inner critic. It's all about her little technique. Oh, no, no. Taken off and adjusted. <laughs> oh dear, I'm so I sorry. All right, back to <laughs> This does kind of cut them on their own little timeline of grievance um, for the BCA appeal. They are in their open period for if they choose to appeal that particular grievance decision. Um, but They've indicated it doesn't sound like they will, that they seem satisfied with that adjustment on the grievance. So why would we uh, approve this now before the grievance period's over with? The grievance period is over with. For them? BCA, so the grievance period is over. I'm sorry, I spoke incorrectly. It opens up their own time period for BCA appeal. So, okay. They have until the September 12th to be able to do these. So should we just do it at the, our next meeting? Because what if they do, it, it is appealed and... It could be, but it also means that they got an incorrect tax bill that should have been adjusted based on a grievance decision, so that they're going to be paying more, a little bit more than they should have. So you know, out of 163 grievance, that you know grievances that we had out of the 180 meetings that we had hearings unfortunately this is one that we just missed at the tail end in that seven day time period i feel bad well and i feel bad for the property owner so i guess i'm doing my best effort at this point once we realize the mistake to make the correction as quickly as possible since they did everything that they were supposed to do and it just kind of fell through the cracks unfortunately so it's really, I mean, we could have waited, but it's really more about doing what's right for the taxpayer, which is part of what I feel, a big part of our jobs as listed. And letting you guys know what happened, you know, when there's been a mistake, if it's within our time frame and our ability to correct those mistakes, we want to be able to. Whether there will be other, most likely there might be a few others, errors and omissions of things we found, but we were not going to address those until December and try to group that all together with anything that happens with BCA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this one was, yeah. Does everybody understand? <coughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I think we just need a motion to uh, <coughs> accept the. I make a motion that we accept the reduced 
appraisal value of Linda Temple's property on 51, uh, 514.5 from uh, $263,200 to $255,000, a reduction of $8,200. We'll second. Okay. Everybody in of that? Okay. Yep. That's approved. You need to sign. You need to sign. Okay. Thank you. We Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. The next adjustment is, um, I believe, um, we have a buyer for the house, and I guess the, I'll have to hear the details from Dave. So it's pretty well said. Um, we need to formally approve the sale. Uh, it's for $175,000. Um, we also need to post this, uh, again, for the 30-day period before we can close. Um, again, the sale is for 175. They at first wanted an inspection of the house um, as part of kind of the talk back and forth. Um, they were able to accept the um, the inspection of the house that we did prior to purchasing the house, um, but they do want a septic um, an inspection of the septic tank, which is going to happen. I can't remember if it's this Thursday or a week from Thursday. Um, but that has been scheduled and um, will take place. The buyers are um, from Heartland. Um, it is um, a group, a couple that lives on Advent Hill, uh, interested in purchasing the house, fixing it up, and, and renting it out, essentially. This is $2,000 more than um, the agreed upon price of the last purchaser. Uh, last one was at 173, uh, and this one is at 175. What's the closing date? Mid-October. Um, again, it's gotta go through the 30-day period. They've gotta have the septic inspection and the, the, they'll have to close on the loan. So Except do we know anything about the history of the septic? Has it been in working order? And we had it semi-inspected um, back when we listed the house. Mm -hmm. um, we had it pumped and um, we had the baffle looked at and kind of visually looked at I mean, we didn't, you know, we didn't put a scope down or anything like that. But uh, right. um, at that point in time, it was verbally passed on to us that it looked, it looked in pretty good shape. Okay. Yeah, everything that we wanted them to look at was didn't need to, we didn't need to address anything. Um, it hasn't been used for you know, a year and a half at this point, but um, mm -hmm. everything visually at that point looked okay. okay. It's good news. Yeah. So what do we need to do? We need to make a motion um, to accept uh, the offer of $175,000. Um, if you want to make it a little bit former, you can say accept the offer from the Gadakia um, couple for $175,000 for the purchase of the Route 21, uh, the 21 Route 12 house. Okay. Seems like everybody would agree to that, I think. So I'll make a motion with the board approve the sale price of a hundred is that it? One hundred and seventy five thousand. One hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for the twenty one or twelve house. I think that's sufficient. Okay. I'll second it. Okay. Any other discussion? Everybody's good? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I also okay. recommend you just make a secondary motion that allowing me to sign the necessary paperwork to carry that out. Could have put it all in one, but I, that was 
I didn't want to ramble on for I make a motion that we authorize Dave Ormiston, our steam town manager, to sign the necessary paperwork associated with the sale of the 21 You can do better than that. Come on. <laughs> Second. Second. You second. Yeah. Okay. The short version. <laughs> the motion is for authorizing Dave to handle the details of the sale. So, everybody good with that? Yes. yes. Okay. You're on. Okay. Very good. That'll be a good thing to have done. Yes. So we have more public here than usual. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they want to bring up? Just here for the fun of it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, so I guess uh, first thing on the agenda is you, Tom. And Bob. And Bob. I'm just the back. Yeah. So, uh, let us know what you have to offer about composting and sure. we'll listen. So, um, one of the criteria we have is that we need to <coughs> notify and get a resolution or permission or whatever from the host board of selectmen uh, about any facility that is proposed to be built. Uh, through the Greater Corvallis Solid Waste System. Uh, probably a month, six weeks ago, there was an Act 50 application that was submitted and circulated. The town got a copy of it. But what this is, is a 60 foot by 60 foot concrete building with a steel, with a steel structure. And it's going to be used to collect uh, packaged and unpackaged food waste. And this is all part of the state of Vermont's effort, well, not effort, there's a law in effect that bans organics in the landfill beginning July 1st of 2020. The, uh, the state of Vermont about four or five months ago had a program to try to um, uh, stimulate investment in this, and so it's a grant program, so the, the district got a, a grant that uh, will pay for 40% of the cost of the, of the building. The, so the materials are going to be coming from grocery stores, large institutions or smaller institutions, uh, transfer stations and the like. It will be brought in on a smaller truck generally, about 23 feet long. It'll be dumped or tipped, as we call it, onto the floor. The floor will be made of concrete. And then it will almost immediately be placed into a sealed uh, trailer that is about 45 feet long. After the trailer has been filled, it will be transported to Maine, where it will be used in an anaerobic digester. Uh, this past summer, uh, we got to travel to this place, and it's uh, the largest dairy farm in Maine. And what they do is they're mixing this stuff with the manure they have from the dairy farm. They run it through their anaerobic digester. And one of the, and so the digester does two things. One is it creates methane, which produces, which is then produces electricity. And it uh, generates enough electricity for about 10,000 to 11,000 homes. The byproduct of this is a dried material that is actually used as bedding for the cows. So they keep recirculating this stuff. And they basically pipe the manure from the dairy farm to the, to the, to the digester. It was, it was really, really fascinating. So uh, we're working on all our permits. We, I visited the Planning Commission last week. We got a draft permit conditions for Act 250. We got draft permit conditions for the stormwater. We're waiting on our solid waste permit and our wastewater permit. Uh, so, so that's what's happening. It's uh, 
uh, it'll generate about 20, 20 well, we'll up broadly about 30 trips uh, at when it's at full build out. And per day or? Per day. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 trips of what? Of for, trips, so, oh, sorry, this is truck traffic, sorry. Uh, so oh, trucks. Planner mm -hmm. ease. Uh, yeah, uh, and that would include both the smaller trucks <coughs> and then the big tractor trailer trucks. We're working very closely with Twin State Sand and Gravel. We're going to be using um, their scale and the line. So. Who's going to maintain the road in the wintertime? Twin State. That's part of the agreement when the district bought, built the bridge. We built the bridge. They, made, they built the road and maintained the road. So I just had a discussion with them last week about that. And we're in agreement on that. They're also finding that they're open more and more in the winters these mm -hmm. days than they have in the past. So. Uh, the cost of the facility will be between five hundred fifty and six hundred thousand dollars. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Where, where is this? Uh, where is this building, sixty by sixty building, going to be built? So, if you're familiar with where Twin State Sand and Gravel is, I don't know if people are. So, you, you go to the very. Everyone know what Quarry Road is. You go to Dale's Mobile Home. So you go up Route Five, the steep top of the hill. On the right is Dale's Mobile Home. The next street after the Dale's Mobile Home is Quarry Road. And then you go down that road, you'll cross over the bridge, and you go to the very end of the road. At the very end is uh, Twin State Sand and Gravel, and about 100 feet up from that entrance to there is where our entrance is. You will not see this from the interstate. It's set way, way back. Uh, the location of the facility also does not infringe upon the proposed landfill site, so it's closer to to Clory, Clory Road. Well, what I'm remembering, Bob, Bob, thinking about it, Bob. Either of you, it doesn't matter. Um, when you when you are there at the facility where the composting is happening, there was one really a small, really flat field, and then a little south of that, there was another field that was kind of tipped a little bit. So in relation to those two fields, where is This the is east of the flat field. Okay. So there's two, if I understand you, Gordon, yeah. there's two fields. There's, we call it yeah. the upper field and the lower field. Yeah. The lower field is one that's on A. The upper field is where the compost facility is, and that is? A little east of that. 300 yeah. yards? Yeah. By 300 yeah. yards east of that, yeah. right almost up against um, where Twin Street <coughs> Sand Road. And the other question is, who's going to take the packaging off? So, so this is a great, this is, interesting. This is a really uh, great thing. So they have what they call a uh, depackager in Maine. And it removes the plastic and it removes those little square tabs that hold the plastic bag together. It'll actually spit those, spits those out. And at the end you have this, this um, pile of plastic or contamination also removes contaminants like plastic forks or forks or, or whatever. Um, that product is then actually sent um, to a, a, a burn plant in Scarborough, Maine, and that's also turned into energy. Oh, I picture a lot of people handling the stinky <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's basically, it's, a, it's an extruder with a screen, and it just pushes it right through this screen. Yeah. Tom, you mentioned that uh, the building costs of 550 to 600,000, but what do you imagine the uh, yearly operational costs would be? So we are, um, we have a lease. So the farm, well, so there's, um, there's the, the, the dairy farm, and then the dairy farm created an LLC for the production of electricity and it's called AgriCycle. And so we have a lease with AgriCycle. They are partnering with Grow Compost. So they're the largest compost organization in Vermont. And they're going to be operating it for, um, but we have a lease for five years with them. I don't know the specific operational costs, but what they're doing is they're paying us roughly about $5 a ton to 
to dispose of this material. And so to give you an idea, at full build out, this facility will be able to handle between 15 and 20% of all the organics in the state of Vermont. You know, I mean, that, that's great. It sounds like quite the facility, but there's still an expense for us to get it there. So and that's all part cycle. of AgriCycle. So AgriCycle okay. is the one who's delivering it. All we're basically doing is looking at the revenue side. We're not, we don't, not, we're not responsible for, um, for the operational cost okay. on this. They are also required to provide us with a, a minimum payment on, on, a, on a monthly basis hmm. of, uh, of $2,500, whether they bring anything in or not. There's a base payment of $2,500 right. to the district. And one of the things that we're, so the purpose of this is, is twofold. One is we would like to try to assist the state of Vermont with providing the infrastructure to address organics. But the other thing is that the district has really been trying hard to come up with revenue generating ideas to reduce the amount of, of debt. As you all know, when it comes to budget time, you are charged a per capita fee by the district to basically pay for the bond for the bridge. We've gotten that down to $11 per capita, and we're looking to do is through this is to continue to reduce that, that amount so that there's less of a burden on the, on the participating towns in the district. Okay. And this uh, digest digester in Maine is actually operational today? Oh, yeah. Okay. There's three of them there. And is there any prospect of a closer one, one in Vermont? So, so, um, right. so that's been a, a good question. A lot of people have been asking that. Yeah. Right now, there just is uh, no one who has the type of infrastructure that this place has. We certainly would be willing to work with others once we start to develop the infrastructure in Vermont. But because in the past, um, uh, Casella, who owns the only landfill in the state, actually wants the organics because it creates methane, mm -hmm. and then they're siphoning off the methane from the from the landfill to produce energy for them for themselves. Okay. So there hasn't been a whole lot of impetus to develop the infrastructure in, in Vermont because it's expensive. That the packager that I talked about is between five and seven hundred thousand dollars alone. Yeah, I can imagine. yeah, they're very expensive. Yeah. Right. And and I'm just. I don't remember the laws right now, but you're talking um, commercial and restaurants and so on, composting. When does it hit the domestic side? And do you, is the, the volume at the domestic side is ex expected to be the same or less than the commercial? So they believe, so there's a difference between collection and generation. And uh, one of the things that the that GUV has been doing, trying to do, is for promote backyard composting. Mm -hmm. And so we may not see a lot of the organics because people are just either feeding it to their chickens, yeah. throwing it over the bank, or or, or creating their own composting uh, little operation in, in their in their backyard. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't know the, the specific <laughs> breakdowns, and Mary may know this yeah. better than I do, but. Uh, Right now, the focus is on institution and commercial Great. so on. But do you know that break? Well, I was just going to say it's July 1 next year. Next year, 2020. You're, okay. I'm sure you're doing it already, right, Bill? Yeah, I, 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 I modeled after Cy Osman. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, I don't know the, back, uh, the breakdown. I, yeah. I know we've been told it, but I can't remember. I can't remember either. Mm. Okay. So you want some money, huh? So, uh, no, I know what no, they, no. no, we're not looking for no. any money. No. We're going to get uh, money. So it says in one of the things so that a, um, you know, a host community can get a host community fee. And uh, we are hoping that you. Uh, this is in the fine print. You can't I, I can see it. It's 8B. 8B. Look at 8B. If you see what, it, what we got to read, it's like a two-point Yeah. I, I actually, um, I tried to reduce it even further. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can read it. 8B. Okay, I'm looking for it. Reimbursement from the owner to the host municipality, Hartland, 
for reasonable incremental costs incurred by the host municipality, Hartman, for highway culvert and bridge improvements and maintenance attributable to the facility. So we would need to know at full build out uh, what 30 trips a day would do to that road. It sounds like it would be really fragile and we need to get a lot of money for maintaining it. We're also thinking of closing the bridge and Twin States and the gravel. We need to go back to West Lebanon and close their operation. <laughs> So our, 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 so this is true, and I said this today, so for, for full disclosure, we're hoping you won't charge us a fee. Like I said earlier, we're really trying to do is whatever revenue we can generate from this is to put it toward reducing the per capita, because I think right now you're paying about, what, 37, 38,000, more than that? Yep, 30, 39. 38, 39,000. And we really want to try to get that amount. We know that that's a lot of money. Wow. So let me go back to Matt's question and, and your answer. Um, Quarry Road, the, the full length of Quarry Road is maintained by Twin, Twin State, State Sand and Gravel. Okay. And then we go on to a state highway after that. Yeah, Route 5. Route 5. Route 5. Route 5. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Sounds like you don't think it's going to have much impact on her. That'd be great. It's already getting 200 trips a day of heavier traffic, so. Dump trucks yeah. coming out of quarry. So just, and I uh, sent this to the planning commission just so you folks know, <coughs> way back when, when you did the Act 250 for the landfill, you agreed to have upwards of 750 trips a day. What? Yes. Well, we're we're going to go like a million dollars a week, though, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's true. 750 trips a day? Yes. Those were bicycle trips, right? Really. I mean, you'd have to have one, what, every minute? That doesn't even make any sense. No, it's round trip, so that's divide that by two. It would be, if it was a landfill, there'd be a tremendous amount of traffic going in there. I mean, Casella is like 20 times as big, but if you've ever been on Route 100 going into Coventry, it's, tr it's tremendous. So you don't want, you don't, are not proposing to give us any money? I, I am just a lowly worker for this uh, waste district. I don't. Hmm. This has not been discussed by the in our seriousness. It hasn't been discussed by the board, but I did want to bring it to your your attention. So, uh, can we um, sign on to this uh, for a period of time, not forever? So that it can be so if you would like right now in the permit it says it's 28 trips a day, and that's for a five-year period. If you wanted to do it for the five-year period, and if we start to see a lot of expansion of the trips, um, you know, start to increase a lot, we can come back and talk about. I mean, in all seriousness, we want to be good neighbors and do the right and do the right thing. But uh, compared to other operations that are presently there, this is minuscule. No, I'm just thinking that if a if a truck comes, say down Route 12, they might. How would they go? They might take a shortcut through Heartland to get to Route 5. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that there's not going to be any truck traffic going yeah. through Heartland over yeah. on the way over there. I'm not suggesting that at all. Um. Yeah, Gordon, right. I like that idea of maybe just doing a yeah, right. you know, fee for uh, for a three to five year period and then review it at that point. Yeah. Sarah? I just didn't understand one thing that had been said earlier, so I was just looking for a clarification. It had to do with the bridge versus the road, and that could, you go back and repeat. Sure. Who paid for the bridge? And then if if the bridge needs repair as opposed to the road, then who will be liable for that cost? So back in the 1990s, when they were uh, talking about trying to build a landfill, they initially were trying to go through White River Junction over South Main Street and up sort of the back, the back side. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, there was um, not a lot of uh, support for that from the town of Hartford. So then the district decided to um, see about building a bridge 
And when did they just start to do the bridge? In 2000? Years or so. so, so we'll say about 15 years ago or so, they decided to build a bridge. They had a bond vote of all the, the town member towns, and you basically voted to tax yourself to build the bridge. The agreement was that the district would build the bridge, and Twin States, Sand and Gravel would build the road from the bridge to their operation and maintain the road and that's how that that worked and that was part mm -hmm. of the Act 250 permit. So there's actually a signed document that states, you know, you know so. Secondly, the, um, as far as the bridge is concerned, so the bridge shouldn't need any maintenance for a minimum of 25 to 30 years. There, um, there may be, and uh, Twin States and Gravel has been watching the bridge on an annual basis, and we may need to put coating over the, over the cement portion of the bridge as a uh, protection against corrosives and the like. But generally, for, for quite a while, we shouldn't need anything. The district is uh, going to develop a sinking fund for the eventuality when, when some more significant maintenance has to be done. But AOT has said that it's, it's going to be a long time uh, before that's going to happen. Tom, uh, uh, the state in its transportation asset management plan has a shorter time period for bridge maintenance than 25 years. Um, so I'm wondering, I, can, I almost was ready to pull it out. I don't know if I really have it with me or not. But Yeah, I just, I just, cause I just had this discussion. Um, so this is before my time. I just had this discussion with Twin States and Gravel in the types of beams they did and the coatings that they used on the beams yep. is going to extend the life and they, I guess they use membranes and so on. So I'm just parroting what I heard last week. Sure. I, you know, but so, but the, uh, I guess but, but Sarah's question, question is still on the table. Who, who pays for it? Should. So the district pays for the, will pay for the maintenance. This, okay. The state of Vermont is not going to take over the mm. bridge. Okay. And, and so when I say the district, again, the district is made up of the member towns. Yep. So at some point, you know, the member towns will be responsible for the bridge. But what I am saying is that um, the, the district is not ignoring the fact that there will be future costs that could be significant right. to maintain the bridge. Okay. And that right now we're doing everything we can uh, as far as good maintenance so that um, we can get the most out of it as, we, as possible. And the whole part of it is corrosives and salt and so on. And so it is, um, it is being washed and so on on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. so, Tom, you indicated that Twin State is talking about doing some surface coating or something on the bridge. So what is our arrangement? What is the district's arrangement with Twin State as far as sharing costs of maintenance? Of the bridge, it, it's on the district. Really? Yes, the, the okay. district is responsible for the bridge. Twin State is responsible for the road. All the rest of the road. Okay. So the I just want to get the financing. So forty percent of let's say five hundred fifty thousand is what the state grant is going to pay for. Yeah, I think you can have that. Yeah. So let's say that's two hundred twenty thousand. So then you guys are on the hook for 330? Right, so the, the way we're, we're doing this is we're, we're looking to get approximately $250,000 from the state. We're gonna have a five-year bond with Mass, through Mascoma Bank for upwards of around $270,000, and the district is going to provide $100,000 of their own funding. So how much um, income do you think you're gonna this is gonna generate annually so I can forward these to you but um, beginning in July of 2020 uh, roughly sixty thousand dollars 2021 seventy thousand dollars so roughly between seventy and ninety thousand dollars a year annually. 
uh, full bill now. So that's going to be used. Uh, and how are, you, how are you going to lower our per capita at the same time you're repaying this bond? So the um, so roughly we will have until the bond is paid off between thirty and fifty thousand dollars of revenue over expenses, and so then a portion of that funding will go to reduce the per capita fee. Tom, would you repeat what happens when the truckload of compost arrives at the farm in Maine? So then it's, what do they do with it's, it? it's put into a bunker. It is then mixed with manure. And then it's fed into an anaerobic digester. And the anaerobic digester is basically a heat and a bunch of bacteria. And it mm -hmm. creates gases that are then burned off that then run a turbine to create electricity. But first it's depackaged. But it's depackaged, yeah. yeah. I got the depackaged Thank you. So some people in our business think, well, you know, all this stuff is being trucked to to uh, Maine and, you know, they talk about the carbon footprint, but right now all that's going into a landfill. So, you know, I think the thought is that we are ahead I mean, you think of all the grocery store shelves, they don't take anything in glass, you know, applesauce or jam or anything, but everything else, that's not going to a landfill. And um, I think the net is that it's positive for the environment. And, and most of that food, it's not like you're taking um, minerals and nutrients out of Vermont and, and you know, not replacing it. most of that food is not grown here anyway. So, Tom, without this outlet, what are we what are we doing with the screw? What's the prospects for disposing of the food scraps properly, so to speak? I mean, what? There's, the infrastructure is fairly poor. Uh, there is another fairly large. So, AgriCycle is probably one of the largest in New England as far as who does this. There's another organization out of Illinois called Organics. They're also moving into the state. And I found out last week that Casella was also going to be getting into the organics business as well. So right now, you know, the it's 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 early on. Uh, infrastructure is not great, but people are making efforts to try to address it. Uh, we're not going to be fully prepared to address all the organic needs July 1st of 2020. We're just not going to have the infrastructure for it. Uh, there is and, and there's, you know, other things going on as well as far as um, a lot of farmers have been taking it and using it to raise chickens. And there's sort of this little fight going on right now between the Department of Agriculture and the Solid Waste Division as far as uh, whether that's an appropriate thing to do because they're not basically following the solid waste laws by doing that. So they're having this, they're having this, uh, this discussion, I'll say, about that. So right now they're getting a lot of it. Some of it. Um, um, when, when this becomes operational, at what um, percent of capacity, let's put it, put it that way, is it going to be operating? 100% or, yeah, initially? Very little. Uh, so you have a lot of capacity. A lot of capacity, so. Beyond what um, you've got lined up, yeah. So it's really hard, so we, we've overbuilt this okay. uh, because one of the permit requirements we have is that the uh, organics can only be on the concrete floor for 12 hours. Uh, we don't even want it on for 12 hours because it's kind of a mess, especially in the summer. So you really want to try to do is to get it into this trailer that's gasketed and then it has a sealed cover on it. Uh, it's a good way to control vectors and also odor. Uh, and so it's, it's hard, to, hard to know. Um, but I would say at full build, I was probably 60% of the building would be used. So there may be other uses for the building. Uh, one of the things that uh, 
some of the other communities are really trying to address right now is there's no place to bring construction and demolition waste because uh, Hartford has stopped accepting it and uh, the uh, city of Lebanon and the landfill there are getting fairly rigorous as far as how they want to see it. They don't want to see any contamination in it. So, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with this building. But that has nothing to do with this building. Yeah. Well, my question is, is I guess I'm aiming back towards the amount of traffic that might spill around over the Heartland Roads because of so that, that expansion of the so that uh, yeah. those those traffic numbers are based on twenty five thousand tons a year. No, two hundred fifty thousand tons a year. Which is what percent? Of, what part of the capacity is that? Oh, it's probably 70, 80% of the capacity. Mm -hmm. So, right now, there, so we have an operation similar to this going on in Springfield, Vermont, and they're doing about 400 to 500 tons a month right now. So, a truck, a trailer can only take 30 tons. Um, if we make a motion, um, I two questions. One is how long, three years or five years? What, what, are, what are people's thoughts on that? I've got, a, I've got one more question. Yep. I'm sorry. Can you, so you're not running the facility? We're, no, we're overseeing it. Can you, can you mandate or request that all traffic Leaving the facility goes north? No. You can't. Why not? Well, yeah, why not? So they need to go south. Well, they can go north and south to White River instead of coming through Hartford. So do you mandate that all traffic from Twin States and Gravel goes north? Uh, that's a little bit different. Why is it different? Because Twin States and Gravel is not owned by the public. I don't understand the difference. Why are you well, going to make it more expensive for us? I mean, I could say yes. I mean, there's no it, way I can control but that. It's, it's going to Maine, isn't it? Most of it. Well, I'm talking about the smaller trucks. Oh. You see, so one of the smaller yeah. trucks may need to leave yep. and have a no, pickup stay down in Brattleboro. I understand that. Yep. I, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a, it's a thing that's very, very difficult to, to control unless someone is actually standing there watching it. You know. All right. It's logical they would go north if they're well, for me. The, the trailers okay. will definitely be going north. That's what I would be worried about. Really yeah, it's the trailers will definitely yeah. be going north. In my idea, it's three. Three? Yeah. Okay. And then should we spell out that that the amount that we're not charging be used to reduce the cost of the bridge on or just leave that out? I don't think we need to say anything. So no, I don't think we need to get into that part. Okay. Well I, let me try this for a motion. Okay. Uh, Heartland agrees for a period of three years to waive reimbursement from the Greater Upper Valley, blah, 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 for reasonable costs incurred by Heartland for highway culverts, bridge improvements, and maintenance of roads attributed to the Greater Upper Valley composting facility. You probably want to say organic transfer station. Okay. Because they're two different. Two different operations. That's true. It's not the. Uh, it's not composting because the compost facility no. would be very beneficial to us because there's about six trucks. Okay. Do you have that written down? I yeah, didn't, kind especially of. the blah 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 part. I did not get. Okay. <laughs> you can spell it. I know how to spell it, but somehow there. You know. Also. Uh, I, you know, really like to just come annually and talk to you and, and so on. Not Dave is an alternate member to the district, so if there's any issues, you know, feel free to 
let us know, but I'm yeah. more than willing to uh, come in and I can give you an idea of some of the trips we're doing and, and the like. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited about the prospect. Um, I mean, we all know that other places have tried it and they're still struggling with where to ship mm -hmm. everything. You know, down, right. so. So there's a motion out there. I think I should recuse myself. No. Why not? Do you have a financial interest Legal? in this? Legal? No, I have no financial interest. A marital interest. Should I recuse myself? I don't think so. All right, I'll second the motion. You're, you're actually more knowledgeable about the whole thing than any of the rest of us. Why would you? Well, I, uh, I can be swayed by the man in the front row there, so... May I make a... Um, you haven't said whether or not you approve of us building this. You've just talked about... So it's implied that you approve of it, but it would be nice for the record yeah. if you could have some statement saying that you approve of us moving forward with this, if you don't mind. Yeah. But I guess that will be part of the first part of the motion, maybe. Uh, About front loading. At the beginning of that motion, we approved and. Um, yeah. I don't remember what it said, but. Why don't we simply just add another sentence in front of it that says Hard the Hardland Select Board approves the. Um, concept and the building of the organic transfer station. Select Board approves the concept and building of the organic transfer station and agrees for a period of three years to waive reimbursement from the Greater Upper Valley Solid Waste, whatever those letters are, Management and District for um, reasonable costs incurred by Heartland for highway culverts, bridge improvements and maintenance of roads. Is that right? Uh, attributed to the use of the... Okay, attributed to... The organic transfer station. Use. We'd love them to sort of help fix Advent Hill, but that's not... <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to stretch that? <laughs> Okay. You got a second? Yes. Okay. I second it. Any more discussion? Any more okay. questions? Everybody good with it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Sure, you don't want to stay longer, Bob. I'm good. <laughs> okay. This is a hard one. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So moving along, we're down to the. Uh, Community access TV discussion. This is this is essentially a discussion. Kind of, I sat in on a meeting last uh, week ago today um, with the board of CATV, uh, along with the town managers of 
uh, Lebanon, Hartford, Norwich, myself, um, and, and Hanover, did I say Hanover? Anyway, five of us. Uh, the five towns that uh, CATV um, services. Essentially, there was a, an FCC decision that um, potentially is going to cut the revenue for CATV um, upwards to 60%, uh, or anyways, 30 to 30 to 50, 30 to 60%. Essentially, the cable stations pay a fee um, to the local service channels. Um, it's kind of mandated through their use of, you know, the cable stations have essentially community use of easements and rights of ways and, and other aspects that are, that are granted to them. And in return of that, they were to pay essentially local channel stations a fee to provide a community good essentially was kind of the thought process behind it. Uh, and the FCC has, and I believe, I think if you look at your cable bill, there's an actual line item that specifies the amount that they're raising to go to this, to, to pay the fee. So the payer, or the, the user does pay for it. Uh, FCC has ruled that um, the, it's a little complex, but um, a certain amount of costs, in-kind costs that the cable stations incur um, in conjunction to local, the local programming can be essentially charged back to the local programmers. So they're not exactly sure what that is going to look like, but essentially nationwide uh, and Vermont-wide, they're expecting a 30 to 50, 30 to 60% decrease in the revenues that they're gonna receive. So they're looking to make this up in two ways. Um, the towns that utilize the services, CAT services, CATV services, and the secondary, they're gonna essentially do a promotion, kind of like a PBS or a Vermont uh, public radio type of fundraising to try and fundraise half of this. So they're hoping to get 30% from the towns and 30% through fundraising. Uh, in your packet, I did give you an, an amount um, that, so the 30% the loss in revenue comes out to be, I don't have the number right in front of me, it's like 130 something thousand dollars. 136. $136,000, and they look to break that up between the five towns um, based upon population. Uh, and Heartland comes out um, at roughly $10,900. Uh, so they're essentially, if, will be coming to the towns to ask for uh, $10,900. Uh, my response to them was that the board would uh, most likely put that to the voters. Um, you know, and you can do that in two ways through, um, they can, you can, you need to sign a petition or the select board can waive the petition and can choose to put the appropriation or the article on the ballot on town meeting day. Um, there is essentially one person full-time, well, more than that, but uh, one person in particular that would be tasked to do this. So, um, you know, at the very least, they were asking if the select board could choose to put them on um, as an article um, for the town to vote. It would be appreciated. It would kind of save the time and effort to get the petition. But um, nevertheless, it was an understanding that Hartwin would most likely ask to put them in front of the voters. But um, that's kind of, so I, as we move towards this in the town manager update, we're getting into the beginnings of the budget season. Uh, we'll be talking quite a bit about the budget in November towards Thanksgiving. So this be, will become you know, more of a conversation as it gets plugged into an appropriation type uh, thing. But um, they come up with a number, um, and I expect that um, they will come and speak with us, but I certainly wanted to kind of give you an update what the situation is with CATV um, and what they will be asking for from the towns. Um, did receive an email today, actually. Um, they they um, have cut their lease with um, one of the places that they're at as far as I think a lot of their editing and stuff like that. So, you know, they're, they're feeling as though this could be 
um, I think mid October was when they were going to find out what these revenue shortfalls start to look like um, and could feel that pinch, but um, certainly they're they're kind of in a panic mode at this point in time. Yeah. Um, certainly feel as though it could it, it endangers the local access. Dave, this is this is, this has almost happened a few times, uh, and under the current administration, there is a push to make it happen. Do, do you, is, has the FCC actually ruled? Is is it? I think they did. I, I don't know. I think they did. Didn't they? My understanding is the FCC has ruled. Has ruled. Yep. Yeah. And this is a ruling. And this is a result of the ruling. And and where they're at and what their expectations are. And you're saying they moved out of the tip top building? Is that? Uh, uh, to or are space? going to. Well, and they're looking for places that might be available that people might be willing to right. make available to them. I mean, there's an awful lot of content that's broadcast over the air, and I just don't know what the percentage is that is local municipal government. You know, it it says stuff. in here. I mean, yeah, it says, heard. but does it, give, it doesn't give it percentage programs. Yeah. Well, just in sheer numbers of what they do, uh, I really feel like they uh, help underpin our democracy, our democratic process, and this would be another, um, just another structure in our country that will be, you know, just go by the wayside if we don't take ownership of it, take some stewardship here. So. I'm not one to, you know, increase what we pay, but if you look at per person, it's not much, and really they, it helps people be involved in their local governments. One thought I have is um, Heartland and Norwich are pretty small, pretty small percentage compared to the other towns. And then I think about Windsor County, and we've got one, two, three, three towns represented here. What about all the rest of the towns in Windsor County? I don't think the CATV reaches out to them. I don't I think this service that we're having tonight comes to that town. I know. You know. So that's not too good, is it? Right. I mean, if we're thinking about what Mary's, what Mary said, right? Mary's saying, I'm just... Just, just don't think what we're, I mean, we, we, I'm kind of in favor of keeping this going, but I, it's not a very good solution when you look at the whole picture. And I wonder if there's a better way. I don't know why we would, I'm just wondering if we said, let's not do it, if they would think, Maybe this other way we could expand it to all the towns on a here and there basis or something. Sarah? I was going to ask if Dave could maybe expand a little bit more on that meeting and whether, you know, why it would, whether there was any discussion about why it was limited only to certain towns participating. So that, that I'm not entirely sure. Like, for instance, Woodstock kind of went their own way for Woodstock has its own, I don't know if it's just the town of Woodstock programming or how that's set up. I'm not exactly sure the setup of, of who gets covered and, and how, um, other than there was discussion about Woodstock being unto itself and they expect that to just go away. They're not going to be able to survive. Um, I don't know how it came to be in only these five towns, um, other than um, the four towns themselves, um, Hartford, Lebanon, Norwich, and um, uh, who am I missing there? Hanover. Hanover tend to do, tend to act as a block. So when I was with Norwich, we, they meet like monthly and they talk about keep things to do cumulatively and it's kind of the greater upper valley and, and the, kind of the mega center. So to me that kind of makes sense and it's almost like Hartland is kind of lumped in there and from time to time, that happens. That's the only thing that can come to mind. Um, and, and if I could comment further, it would 
seem as if, if we were to follow Mary's line of thought about how important this form of, of community communication is for a region, and if they're already saying that Woodstock may lose what it has, to not invite Woodstock to come to the table, to not invite Plainfield to come to the table. Um, and I think of Plainfield because I know when I served on the school board here, folks who live in Plainfield would comment to me about having watched the Heartland School Board meetings um, and things we were struggling with at the time. So I've had that sort of you know, little test flag Windsor, what, really what is, the, what is the viewer scope, not just what are the communities who are covered such as you are being covered tonight. And so could, would it be appropriate to go back to the group and say, this is so important, could it be a bigger conversation before we start to solve it? From my, what I understood is that would, that, that would be difficult at this point. So there was a tremendous amount of conversation about, you know, what you plan for the next five years type of thing. You know, where you think about streaming and you're thinking about, you know, whatever. So the problem that what you bring up and the problem with some of the things I brought up at the meeting is that that would take additional resources. So in order to reach out, you know, in order to do more towns and to do more things, you need more cameramen, more cameras, et cetera, and the revenue stream is an unknown. So they would have to, before they were to bring on other towns, they would have to ensure themselves that the other towns are, you know, that there's a revenue stream to get there. At this point, my understanding, and they even had, I didn't look through it, but they even had kind of a booklet of, you know, had this not happened, you know, kind of a plan, you know, of where they wanted to go forward. And they've kind of indicated that we're going to take this and we're going to put it over here. Right now, we just need to ensure that we can, we can provide something to do a Heartland Town Man, you know, a Heartland Town Select Board meeting, you know, so that, you know, at this point, they're they're fighting just to keep what they've got. Okay, and and actually, I was envisioning it just the reverse of what you're saying, which is that other towns that are already watching this channel, you know, looking at this source of information, be invited to help, so that in the future, maybe they could have that service for themselves. I, we didn't get into I can't, yeah. I can't answer it. Okay. Thank you. I would like to see him do a petition just because I'd like to see everybody else do a petition at the same the same. I don't I don't like the rubber stamping the warrants continually. So well, it does help educate people ahead of yeah. Town meeting, which stand a better chance of passing it. Town yeah. meeting if they have to do a petition. I don't. I mean, that's not a big deal to do a petition. No, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. What, what was their argument against that? I mean, they drop off petitions. I there's like one and a half people. They need to do yeah. fundraising. They need to do petitions. They need to do operations. They need to do. You know, All right, well, I would volunteer to just monitor that and pick them up and bring them over. I mean, that's not a problem. That's super easy. Got to do my part for democracy. Freedom's not free. What else cliche can I come up with? I mean, I really feel, I guess, pretty strongly about this. We got to keep communications, uh, communication going. Talk to you afterwards. Okay. If you really want to get involved, then. Nope. That's about the extent of it right now, Dave. They said we can really use a board member from Ireland, but anyway. Oh, all right. Well, we'll, we'll talk something about something to it. think about. I'll volunteer you for something. Yeah. Well, maybe um, I think when this whole thing came about years ago, that the, the airways were considered to be public property. Mm -hmm. And then when 
these cable people closed in on it, to, they were asked to ante up 5%. Now they've, so all I'm thinking is that maybe with, uh, it, may, it may go back the other way at some point, if with a different administration or different thinking in Congress. I just want to hold on to that happens. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, if it does, then I could see the cable company saying we should pull out entirely because they're, they're delivering content over a medium, uh, you know, either satellite or yeah. physical cable um, versus a, a streaming activity on the Internet. And they're just two different, totally different animals and different production costs and so on and so forth. So it's a slippery slope a little bit, um, and I can see a little, you know, I still don't see why the FCC is lightening up, but that's another issue. So an interesting question is just drop the TV part of CATV and just go to a streaming solution. There's still, you still need labor um, to film and to, to make a production. Um, and then you have no revenue source. That's a bad idea. Yeah, drop <laughs> that off entirely, Phil. So it did come up, um, and it's in your packet. They kind of address that, and that the cord cutting doesn't seem to be as strong in the Upper Valley as oh, yeah. perhaps nationwide. I, I can't vouch for that. It's just what was kind of passed on to me. Interestingly enough, when I watch videos from CATV, it's off their website. Right, and that's how I do it. I don't, I, I don't even. It's only once I've been in a location when all of a sudden I was realized I was watching a Hartford Select Board meeting on the TV. <laughs> yeah. uh, so. mm -hmm. Okay. Don't you try to make a motion? Because we're early on, I think that the I think if it was, if I can get kind of a consensus feedback as to this is that that the board would prefer that they do um, a petition. If that seems to be the consensus. I think that that's kind of some feedback I can give them. I can say I do have a select board that's interested in, you know, helping you with the petition drive, you know, to alleviate that burden from, you know, the, the staff that they've got. Mm -hmm. If I can give them that indication, I think it will help their mindset and what they need to do, you know, because they will need to, you know, there are dates that they need to do it by and, you know, they'll need to coordinate with you, Mary, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So. Um, I can maybe CC you on the email I send back to her. Great. Connect you guys. So are we headed in the right direction? I mean, I, I agree with Matt. I don't know the rest of the board here. What exactly are you agreeing with him the about? The petition is a good is a Yeah, I agree. yeah. I agree. Rather, rather than, because we can simply put this on the ballot mm -hmm. for town meeting. We don't have to have a petition. Mm -hmm. But um, I think a, a petition is a good way to go. I, um, what's the value of the petition versus the well they they have to it, it will um, it will advertise the the concept ahead of time before the meeting yeah okay. I, okay. I don't I mean I'm not sure it's going to reach many people but it certainly it may reach some mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I guess we don't need a motion then. But you hand it to you. Okay, so Roger's here. Can you, uh, are you, um, I don't know who's involved with the, uh, Planning grant. Maybe Roger is not. He is not. Okay, he's here for the. He's not real. I mean, indirectly, they kind of is because they 
well, they he's signed signing. off that they recommend applying for the grant. You know, there's not, we're not really, yeah. so to go back in time, um, we've talked about an ordinance for um, building permits um, off and on. There was discussion about having two rivers on a Quechee write a draft ordinance. Um, my impression is, is they feel as though that's just more than an afternoon's worth of work. Um, they feel as though there's an opportunity to apply for a planning grant to pay for their services to do it. And I think realistically to pay for a lawyer to review it so that we know that what we're looking at for a draft is, you know, on the up and up. Um, again, it still needs to be approved as a grant, but they um, I think the effort here is to apply for the grant to cover them to come to, you know, listen to me, listen to what we've been talking about, to come back to the select board with the writing, go back with any redrafts from there. I mean, there is a bit of a process um, to this. Um, and um, again, they feel as though a planning grant, this is something that may fall within the purview of, um, you know, state funding. So. What we have here is an application for a planning grant to um, that would be used to draw up a draft building code ordinance. This needed a signature from the planning commission uh, to go to as an as part of the application package. Uh, I was there before Labor Day. Um, but obviously, select board needs to support it before the state's going to give us any money to go off and do something like this. Right. Essentially, is what we're looking. At. Um, it, it says matching funds, Dave. So what's what what kind of dollars is that going to be? So I think that, um, you know, when you're talking like 7,500, I don't have it written down, 7,500 bucks, so 20% of that. Um, we're talking 1,400 bucks. Does that come out of the Planning Commission fund? It would come out of someplace in the, someplace in the general fund. I think it's odd. Is this all there is to this grant application? I mean, there's no description. There's a title for the the grant. There's no. So this is just so two rivers will put together the grant application. And but as a part of the grant application, the select board needs to be on board with the thought of applying for grant money to write a. The building permit ordinance. Who gets to approve this once we get it done? Does this have to be done by the whole town or can we do it? The ordinance can be approved by the select board. And it's for how much money? Uh, did I miss that? I actually haven't seen it. So it is for we think five thousand dollars perhaps for a lawyer and another twenty five hundred for for two rivers because this has just got to be a template they've got kicking around over there i mean how how custom is it not very yeah not very so. not very at all yeah so this is you know i think one or two towns have one that we've talked about mm -hmm. and one is kind of sketchy as to the legality of it mm -hmm. so this is you know not of an unheard of thought process but certainly is to be done but you know if i were to do it it would probably take more than a few days. No, I think it's so, it's good. It's, I'm just surprised at the the costs and. So I think that, as with anything, you know, I again, this hasn't been fully, you know, written, but I think that to have a lawyer review it. So, for instance, just simply to have Rob Mamby review 
a 30 day notice to send out for the 21 house cost is over 600 bucks, um, you know, close to $700 for like two hours worth of work. So, you know, he's $250 an hour. Um, so, you know, somebody to do a little research and sit down and, and look at this, you know, so we, picked a number that we felt as though was a safe number, like 20 hours uh. to have somebody review it. So that's $5,000 in a hurry. So if we were interested in this, a grant obviously is a good way to cover something like that. It's um, like a two page thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, it's also a reminder that we don't have the resources to do it ourselves. No, I'm just looking at, look, let's say they give us this money, right? Then, which seems like a lot of money for this small project. Then next time we want to go something that, I, I, you know, these aren't handed out to everybody every time they apply to for them. So is this a good time to use this, this grant? I missed that. All right, so just because we apply for this this year, we get it. All right, that's great but what if we really need one next year like I don't see this as a big well so if you really need one next year we've we've got it so I don't just expect this to be you know you know first of all the grant app this is just for the grant application so that's why you're you're just signing up to you still would need to approve the grant itself so we're right. just we're just signing up to apply for one right 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 so you know there's a month you know you know it needs to be in in a couple of weeks and then there's at least a month or two before you they respond and then there's you know you got to approve the actual grant contract so you three months out before you even put pen to paper so it's not like this is gonna pop up tomorrow no. all right so and then they may say no Right, all right, let's say they say yes. The next year we want money for another thing that's more expensive. They say, oh, well, we already gave you a grant last year for a different project, so, you know, there are all these other towns looking for a grant money, so we're gonna give them the priority. That's all I'm saying. This is such a small thing, is this, you know, time to use our chip? I think, it, I, I'm so not sure you have a hypothetical that's so hypothetical that I can't grasp it. You know, we don't know what we're doing this year. It's taking us how many months to get to this point to sort of do this. So I feel like as, this is not asking for any money. This is basically saying we would like to start the process to ask for money. We may not get the money, and we don't know that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure why we're spinning our wheels and we just don't approve it. And, and, um, Okay. Well, Mary's just saying that it, to her, it makes more sense to just pay the bill. Don't ask for a grant. Thank you. That's, that is what I'm trying but to say. It, 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 the, the bill to who? What are the, what are the costs uh, from? But who's going to actually do the work? Oh, that's two what, that's rivers. Two saying. rivers. Two rivers and whoever has to approve. Uh, and I think it'd be far less money. Lawyer. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I mean, it's, it's all speculation, I suppose. How do, we don't have an exact budget for what the project is. No, but I'm. this is why I led with the thought that this is a, a pretty simple thing. They must have a template already. All they got to do is write in Heartland. It's a two-page thing, and we're willing to pay them $2,500 and $5,000 to the lawyer. If there was a template, Mary, we would, we would have it. We, we, we asked Kevin Geiger for that how many months ago? And he basically came back and said to Ken, we don't have that. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, we're all here when he was standing up in front of us and we sort of asked for that. Um, and I it, I thought he made it sound like there it would be easy that, sure. that there was something right. in a file somewhere. That... Right. Ron, did you have a question? Is this anything that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns would involved with? I think you would, right? Not to actually write it, no. No. But, but they don't have a template somewhere. I mean, how would you go about 
developing ordinances previously? Did you go and spend several hundred dollars for an attorney to weigh in on it? And, and uh, usually we have some, uh, someone else's, like we said, template to follow. This all came about because the listers sure. in, in doing the reappraisal found two or three houses that they didn't even know existed and a number of <coughs> mobile homes that are unlanded. They're mm -hmm. just drawn into somebody's dooryard and people are living in them. And, yeah. and uh, I think it's a good, good so, way to go. So. I don't know. I don't think this is going to guarantee that people are going to be law-abiding, but uh, it's an, an effort, I guess. I'm not opposing this. I just want. Okay, I will not oppose it. My can I put my two cents in? Yes. Yeah. I'm not guarantee. I I don't. I'm not really in favor of a building permit. So I'm not in favor of applying for the grant at this point. One of the biggest reasons is I'm worried about implementation costs, and we don't have a we don't have a plan, and we don't have. And my other feeling is, if we're going to actually we're going to be taking people's freedoms away from what they currently have it now. If I want to go redo my bathroom right now on a Saturday, I go to Home Depot, but we're, we're going to be like the surrounding towns. And if you've worked in these other towns, it can be, it can be a hassle. I don't think it's supposed to cover the redo of a bathroom. <clears throat> so, so, what, so what would it cover? Um, I think we need to have a room onto the house. Well, I think we need to have more information. Yeah. And I'd also like to know the are we going to gain in taxes what this position is going to cost and what the difference actually was from the reappraisal to what was actual. Do you understand what I just yeah. said? That's a good point. So that's where I where I stand. Yeah, that's a good point. So two answers to that. One, I think you jumped the gun on the first question. I think that's to be fleshed out as you write an ordinance um, as to what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Um, the second part is no, I don't think it will cover the complete. You know, to have somebody in to cover the complete offset of the lost revenue. Um, I don't think it will, no. Will it offset the cost of an infrastructure that I think is needed in town? Um, and again, we're gonna jump forward here to something that would be a part B to this, would be an enforcement mechanism um, to offset the cost of, of knowing and tracking and actually having somebody come in and say, we're putting a building in. Um, you know, the process and um, the difficulty that it causes during the reappraisal process or any part of the appraisal process is, is fairly high. But again, is the offset there? No. But if you have somebody who is also tracking, say, floodplain bylaws, or if you were tracking um, junk ordinances, or if you're tracking the driveway permits and cumulatively, and this is an offset to a structure that I think that is needed down the road, then I think that, yes, cumulatively, there is a tremendous benefit to the town for that. Is there a loss in liberties here? Well, three of the things that I just mentioned are already ordinances that we don't enforce that are problematic to the town and cause issues for the town and for us to operate effectively. And we're not asking people to, you know, what color is their house going to be? We're not asking them to set it over there or, or close to there. Um, we're essentially saying if you're going to build, please let us know. Um, I think it's important for the town, again, from an infrastructure point of view, for us to operate and know what's going on and to collect revenues. Um, I do think it's an important step. 
Um, I think there may be some some things there, but um, I'll be honest. I also think that um, that it's easy to operate in Heartland does have an, a, another side of the sword to it that cuts fairly deep and that uh, we are seeing issues out there from a development perspective that are a little questionable. And I think that to be able to tie that into the state wastewater permits or to tie that into you know, um, building code ordinances, so as far as fire safety or something like that goes, I think it's probably a worthwhile discussion. I think that I'm getting a little off track here, but um, I had an email exchange with John Sanders. Um, you know, the state, it's not a town thing, but the state does inspections of apartments, et cetera, and they don't have a real good list of rentals in town. They're not going to get it from me. Uh, they may get it with some work from the listers, but um, you know, there's nowhere in that is that being pulled together is kind of one. Not to mention the likes of the Coley's and you know, um, you know, the Michael Blake's that we're having issues with that's gonna take up my time. Um, you know, that's, that's all, it's all an issue. I'll get into it a little bit with the town manager update, but you know, it's going forward. I think that the town needs to think about what we've got for staffing, what we've got for infrastructure in town, and what we've got to essentially take care of. I'm not looking to set the world on fire here. I'm just looking to take care of the basics. That's kind of it. Roger. I just initially just like to say that I am not in favor of zoning bylaws per se or setting up another infrastructure for a zoning administrator or that type of setup. I just looking for something simple that's going to help the Heartland town base, the estate base and something simple. But it's it's not simple. <laughs> So we have a grant application. We have a grant application. <laughs> I'm not going to get to this in any time soon. Um, we've asked two rivers. They've responded by saying we think a grant application would be beneficial. And our planning commission has already signed off on it. Planning commission, again, they took the tack that it is a grant application. Right. Um, and, you know, said and, we can, we can be on board with applying for a grant. To Matt's point, we're not, we're still exploring what will be in the actual language. So we, we just, this is to start the work of exploration. Putting it on paper. Discovery. So it would be put on paper, they would come back, say, what do you think? If you don't yeah. like, you know, bathrooms, then, you know, right. it might not be. If there is even any language. I mean, that's assuming that we would write anything. Yeah. We would write anything. We don't have to write an ordinance. I mean, I, I don't think we, we have, have to approve it. We don't yeah. have to approve. We don't, we don't have consensus on that. I mean, what if we should even vote on that before we apply for that grant? We don't know what we're voting on. So, I mean, are, are, you know, you're saying, is the concept good? I know, I feel the concept is good. Um, you know, I would like to see the details. Yeah, why, why don't we just put the whole thing on hold until somebody gives us a two-page document to look at? But isn't that what they're what asking the for funding for? Yes. So I know. I, 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 right now, I'm, I'm, I'm losing can, sight of... Who's going to write it? Would you like to sit I down and write it? We would... Uh, they, they don't want to, well, at the moment, they're saying, if we're going to sit down and do this, we feel as though we can get grant funding to reimburse ourselves to do that. And the time to come and sit here and talk about whether bathrooms are or not part of the ordinance, or whether you, you know. Yeah, some, some question whether there's one already exists or not. Some think there are there is one, and some think so, there isn't. So, 
It's a grant application. My understanding is it doesn't exist, otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight. Yeah. Um, are we interested in, in a grant application? Yes or no? Applying for a grant. I'd like to make a motion just to keep it moving and to sort of say that as a select board, we, we agree with the grant application, period. Yeah. Kind of following through on what was asked of us to go out and have somebody drop a copy. That's where we're at. I'll second it. Can we have discussion? You've changed your mind. No, no, I just want to get to the discussion point. I think they're holding us over a barrel. They're not going to do any work for us or, or pull that thing out of the drawer unless they get this. This money, I, I mean. It's a, again, it's a, your, your prerogative to have a hypothetical, this is what's gonna happen. I, I. So, I think there's some underlying issues here with, with, and I personally have some of the same underlying issues as to how regional planning commissions act. They all act like this. That's how they survive. Yes, they do, I know that, I know. They can only get grant money for what they do, it's reimbursable. So if they pull something out of the closet and apply it, then that's an hour of their time that they can get reimbursed for. So it's not like they're gonna pull something out of the closet and magically get 7,500 to 10,000 or whatever it's gonna be. They can't magically pull it out and just simply get money for it. That's not how no, it's not how it works. But wait me, I there's yeah. a fair amount of paperwork involved in order before you get reimbursed. So it's a reimbursable grant. So they do work, they submit what they've done and they get paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming that uh, they would be here either talking with you or talking with you and Gordon yeah. about what we want in it or don't want in it as a preliminary purpose. And before it, it incurs any legal critiques, we would have a chance to sort of. Let me let me out. let me ask a question back to the board. I'm a little I'm a little stumped on something that's I'm just trying to get over. So, what's the difference if Two Rivers puts together a two page ordinance, or Two Rivers puts together a two page ordinance, and they're refunded by a grant? Because I don't think they have to put together one. That's my point. I think. So even if they pull it out of the closet. They want to charge us. And they get reimbursed for it. They're not charging us. They're getting. So even if they pull it out of the closet, that's between them and the state. Yes. We get the two-page ordinance. I'm a little lost for. I'm just looking at our chances for getting a, a grant. Yeah. Let's say two years from now. Yeah. For something else. Yeah. So, and Roger's here. I know that the Planning Commission isn't working on anything too big. I don't think they'll go towards a zoning ordinance anytime soon. So, there's nothing in the future that they'd ever want to I think the near that, future. so even if two years from now they went and asked for a hundred thousand dollar grant to study the town in 19 different ways from a planning perspective I don't think the fact that we got an eight thousand dollar grant two years prior is gonna throw okay. monkey wrench all right and, and we also I, I don't know how the enhanced energy chapter of the town plans funding is that there's a grant there that the department's using right now. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is you have another grant. Mm -hmm. Same, same process, same yeah. concept, other than that it takes a little bit more time than two page ordinance. Guess from where I am, this is just my personal opinion. Whether they get a grant or not, I don't think I care. I think it's, you know, we were asked for a two-page ordinance, and 
you know, if they don't get the grant, what their answer is will be interesting. But uh, this is what they, they said, you know. We'd like to put in the grant. Okay, in the interest of time, we've got to make them move on. I have the motion on the table. Okay, can you read that back? Bill yes. made the motion to approve signing the grant application in Mary's second year. So you should put down maybe the uh, FY20 municipal resolution for municipal planning or something like that, just to tie it to the on agenda. Thank you. You need to adopt the resolution. Correct. The resolution is that you are going to apply for it. Adopt the adopt the fiscal year 20 municipal resolution for a municipal planning grant. So not approved, but adopted. Adopt, correct. Okay, we go. How many votes do we have here? One. I'm opposed. Are you rude? I don't know. What are you thinking, Martha? I agree with Phil. I, I don't see any reason not to. Pursue it. It's n we're not approving it because we don't know what it's going to say. So it seems like having something to look at is in our best interest. Is this something the Planning Commission wants? Dave came in and made uh, the presentation to us. And we, like you, batted it around and had a lot of questions about it and, and decided that it really, if you're going to look at a, an ordinance, somebody's got to write it up so you've got something to look at before you get to where you can present it to the town or, or throw it away. And so if they want to go get a little bit of money and they say, we'll do it, but we want to try to get this money, all we're doing is saying, go ahead and, and see if you can get a grant to cover your cost to doing this thing. That's it. So we finally came to a point of saying it probably makes sense, but we weren't we weren't an easier sell than you folks. You weren't? No. Okay. Well, we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because because they didn't ask for it. You know, the select board asked for it, so they needed to. Your signature is needed on the resolution. And I think that they agreed that applying for a grant to do that is a step. Oh, all right. I'll vote for it. What do you think, Roy? I'm going to abstain. Wow. I guess. I just, I just, just, it'll go ahead without me, so I don't need to. It's just, I'm pretty sure they've got it in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they certainly led us to believe that, I think. And uh, I, I like to spend money on the lawyer. Right, doesn't the grant include a it lawyer? Does. It does. It does. That's good. Maybe the larger discussion is to get Mr. Gregory in here and talk about how the Regional Planning Commission well, that's true. Acts. That is true. That yeah. may be a but different he's, discussion. He's going to charge us for that. He's going to charge us for that topic. Uh, you know, you can catch him on the way home. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Oh. I guess that would be more in favor if the town was just to go. If the town would just hand over the money rather than going mm -hmm. through the grant thing. But, anyways. So we may still end up doing that. <coughs> they say no to the grant. We could very well yeah. say, okay, well, we'll pay. 
Yeah. X amount. Or not. Or not. Because, it, I mean, it does make me think what Matt said about, you know, start on this road. Who knows where it'll go. So what do we need to? We need to finish the motion, I think. I'm not sure I heard. We got a three. We got, we got a three. We got three we votes. Got three? Yeah. yeah. He abstained. So no, he abstained. He's actually need to sign the resolution. So I'll need the people that are voting for it. That's oh, true. You only need three to make it go. I think the whole money thing is, was good. Mark, Matt, you had a good point because these scofflaws, deadbeats who don't pay taxes for five years, even though they have a new house, um, even their, that lost revenue will not cover the cost of a new position, right? From what I've been hearing, there is some concern that we're losing, there's, there's development happening and we're not aware of it. And there, it creates kind of an imbalance, you know, with the taxpayer. Yeah. In that, I think that it's been shown that people don't want to come in and just let us know that we're here. But would that happen? Yes, that's really Could that happen anyway? You see that there's an ordinance? It can happen still, even with an ordinance. I think at some point in time, um, here. as a town is going to need to I don't know what it is. Um, get to a point where even as a simple building code that people know enough or have an incentive enough to communicate with the town that the house is going in. Yeah, I think you're right. Looking so at, that looking at this. We can catch this in the grand list value. Um, it, our reappraisals don't have to, even if we do these reappraisals every five years, which is what I would recommend on a rolling basis, um, so that we are getting out there. Again, I'm going to talk about an infrastructure to the system where you know there is a smooth and systematic way to put information in front of the listers so that they can do their job and the grand list can be more accurate. Is it going to be absolutely accurate? No. no stuff is going to happen, but um, again, it does happen on both ends of the spectrum. And I'll be honest, there is, um, you know, there is a, from my point of view, there is a concern that some of this development is on the low end um, and is hampering the neighbors and the people that are living there um, by not connecting the dots if this development goes in and they don't haven't been to the state for state inspection with <coughs> wastewater that's an issue is that a loss of liberty i will let that up to you to wrestle with that in your mind but i think that there is some of this going on and i think that it's something that we may want to start paying attention to um, so I think that the concept of trying to understand, and again, I'm not advocating it. Again, I'm, I, let me be completely honest that I'm looking at this from an internal point of view and how it affects the administration and the functioning of the town, not whether your house is white or whether it's on a hill or it's too close to the road. Understanding the development that's happening and what effect that has for us to operate, whether it be the, the listers, the highway department, or anything else. And again, you know, I've only had maybe four to five driveway permits in my two plus years that I've been here. Gary, Gary Trotier, who I would expect that may come in, was, was one of them. You know, and another one was another resident that was, you know, very involved in the town, so it doesn't surprise me. A lot of stuff going on out there, and it just is to start to understand how that affects us internally and the cost of the town because of that. I think is just important to 
to start to kind of understand and, and piece that together. It's really all I'm saying. Yeah. I just fear that this isn't going to make any difference. You don't think it's going to make any difference? People that are law-abiding are going to, are going to do it, but right. if they're trying to get away with something, if they don't bother to ask for a driveway permit, and a lot, a lot of the, uh, the unlanded mobile homes, uh, they don't need a driveway permit. They just use the same driveway that's already there. I just don't know how this is going to break the law and just do it anyways. I would just say that I think it's something that, again, I think we need to continue to think about these things. And I think that at the end of the day, I would say that as we grow and develop and continue to do nothing, I don't think that this certainly is going to be beneficial to us. I think it'll probably um, you know, we're all seeing a fair amount of development in town. Um, I think at some point in time, you know, to simply say, okay, yeah, they don't come in and get a driveway permit, eh, okay. You know, I think at some point we may want to say to ourselves, hmm, you know, maybe it's a benefit that they do. What is it going to take to get to that point? There may be a cost to that, but I might argue that I think there's a cost here Anyways, don't need to solve the world tonight. Right. Just putting it out there. Okay, let's move along. So. Thanks, Roger. What do we have to do in regards to the pedestrian? So this is the three corners intersection, the bike pad grant. Three, $269,600 at the town will receive from the state of Vermont for sidewalk work to the three corners intersection. <clears throat> the actual amount or the project estimate for the sidewalks was, I'm going to pull this out of my head, uh, was 336.701. So there is a cost to the town, 20%, again, an 80, 20% match. So the 67,201 will be borne to the town. But that's money we already was gonna spend. We were gonna spend all of it. We were gonna support this program either through the $450,000 that we had earmarked, or we've been talking about perhaps, you know, putting that towards buildings and grounds or something and borrowing money. So either way, that local share was on us. So essentially, we're looking at a grant of 269,600 for the purpose of um, sidewalks. So this is actually for me to fill out and sign, but I didn't want to sign it and fill it out and send it in before I talked to and just let you know that this is the stage that we're at. So we've been awarded the grant. This. I suspect a will, I told you there's, um, there's some strings attached with federal money, so this will probably push us back a bit. I've mentioned before, I'll mention again, we will need to go through the National Environmental Policy Act review. There is a categorical exclusion that makes streams like that, makes it simpler. We already did that to an extent when we did the grant for Queechy Road. So they're going to look at things like historical, you know, artifacts and stuff like that, stuff that they talked about on the bridge project. We'll need to go through back and do that again. Um, we'll need to do some things. We'll need to put some things out to the engineering. So it's kind of one step backwards for kind of two steps forward but that will need to happen. It's a very formal process. Um, we will have Uncle Sam looking over our shoulder, but it is 269,600 towards sidewalks for the three corners intersection yeah, project. Huge. I think this will be work in the short term, uh, particularly for me, um, as this gets lined up as far as putting things on track to actually put it on track, 
but I think once it is on the track that it needs to go to, it actually may streamline this project and bring it in line with the state and other things. So Streamline this project? Well, That's the first. <laughs> Um, it brings, so it's, it's late in the game for this, I'll be honest, you know, we're around in the clubhouse turn and now we, you know, this is, this is a, a program that we originally were going to apply to, I'm not sure, the decision making back in 2015, 14, um, we decided not to, um, and we kind of went our own way on that, so to speak, I wasn't here, but that's kind of what I take of it. We originally had set this up when we applied um, for the, uh, the, the engineering for this. The original RFP indicated that this would be a bike ped program. It ended up, uh, the RFP ended up not stating that. So we decided we detached ourselves from that. We've gotten this far. Um, again, this will pay for essentially half of it. So, I mean, there is a absolute benefit to this. This is something I've been kind of sharing with you along the way that there is um, an absolute benefit to this project. We will get the sidewalk from the post office to the library done. It will cover that. Just know that, you know, we need to dot our I's and cross our T's with agency of transportation. It will take us a bit to do that. My only question is, is, well, I guess it's two questions. It says, when, when, when does it get awarded and are you, are we ready for it to be awarded? It's been awarded. It has. We've got it. So this is telling us, yep. So Bring it we're on. all right with this timeline? I am actually, you know, it's not wholehearted, but um, it may get drawn out a little bit, and we're so, and we're already beyond certain aspects. So this talks about actually putting an RFP out for a design engineer. We've already got the design engineer. You know, part of the backing up to move forward is that the NEPA process or the categorical exclusion may create an expense with the engineer. We got to go back and make sure that the RFP that we put out for VHB fits in with, you know, the, the grant scope of what they want us to do. I don't see that as being a showstopper simply because they're not covering what's been done already. This is simply, it's basically mostly construction work. So, you know, um, that's kind of a benefit. So I don't see anything here that really throws me for a loop. Uh, I did talk to John um, today, the gentleman that kind of oversees this grant. Uh, what will happen is that we will get a supervisor, a you know, assigned to this that we will, I will work with directly. Um, the next step is to hire a project engineer or a project manager, perhaps in the application. It was kind of uncommittal as to whether we would do that or not. Essentially, the town manager has acted as one up to this point. In the $336,000 budget that we put together, we budgeted for one. So 80% of that would be covered. Again, the idiosyncrasy there would be, you know, technically that project manager is only focused on the sidewalks, not the entire project. Um, we could make the decision to have the project manager cover the entire project. I would say by the savings that we get by having the grant, it would probably be well worth our while to take that step, um, just simply because it, again, it gets more focus um, and um, helps make things move along. Uh, and then once you get through that process, it's kind of, you know, we've already got the design engineer, we kind of get into the categorical exclusion, the NEPA and some of the things that we need to kind of pick up to move forward. And then once we can kind of get all the dots aligned and connected, then we can kind of move forward here. Um, the timing of this would have been in 2014 or 15 would have been smoother, but we're essentially picking this up at the construction phase. So we just need to make sure that some of the things that they would have liked to have seen in the design phase is actually done. So we need to do that before we can actually hit the construction. Phase. You do that? It will, uh, in the process that will get done. 
um, whether I do that or a project manager does that, um, we'll determine as we move forward. Um, I would recommend the project manager track. Um, but, um, you know, I've been trying to be as honest as I can as we move forward here. I've been, this isn't anything new. I've been voicing this for a while now. Um, I said if there was anything that really stuck out like a showstopper, that would be it. I think there's some difficulties here. It'll probably slow us down. Um, a bit, but we're already kind of slowed down. So um, I'm, uh, it pulls things together and, you know, should, once we get those design hiccups on track going into the construction phase, you know, it should bring the state of Vermont and the town of Hartland closer to make this, you know, a little bit more coordination with the Agency of Transportation than perhaps we had before. That makes sense. I think it lends a little trust to Teresa Gilman and the permitting process. So I think that knowing that, you know, it's just not the town of Heartland throwing together a construction project. This one actually has some severe oversight by the agency of transportation at this point. Because of this, by because we're right. we're pulling them in, and some money, and and their money. So with their money you get their oversight and some of the headaches we've already experienced. Right. Right. And when you talk about a project manager, the scope of what that person would be doing would start with being handed a detailed project plan uh, that the engineer, is, I assume, would be responsible for developing. It's mainly coordination between the engineer, myself, and the agency of transportation, the project supervisor, mm -hmm. and just kind of, uh, just kind of moving that along. But a project manager can only manage to the plan. So I think you're overthinking the project manager. So you're going to have you're going to have a design engineer. You're going to have a you're going to have a design engineer. Yeah. You got a construction on-site engineer. Right. You got a supervisor from the agency of transportation. And then you got a representative from the town of Heartland, all looking at this. Right. So it's a matter of pulling those pieces together. Okay. So for instance, I spend a fair amount of time, you know, and now the now the engineer is, you know, coordinating between the designs that he's drawn up, Green Mountain Powers designs, you know, and then next is going to become coordinating with the utilities and making sure that they weigh in on it and we get that back. Right. That person is responsible for making sure that the community, he would most likely be, he or she doing the communication, mm -hmm. he or she would be, you know, um, making sure that the, the, whatever piece is supposed to happen next uh, it happens next. So yep. if if the engineer's at a certain point and he's like, okay, I'm waiting on the agency of transportation, this project manager is going to make sure the agency of transportation gets off right. their butt and does it. Right. So you know, it's it's not okay. You know. So it, it, I, correct me, and I think we all know a project plan can be a job in and of itself, and that's not what I'm asking. Yep. Um, so the manager is actually an overall coordinator yep. and understands the critical path and would sort of make judgment calls if the process needs to be sort of tweaked as far as who goes first or second or something like that. I don't think, well, um, when you say who goes first or second. Well, just if something happens with, you know, we have an agreement with one contractor and they can't fulfill it at the last minute. And, what does that mean? And I, I, we don't. It would come back. To the, my it would come back to the town. We'd have to resolve it, right? You know, okay. and we'd have them, you know, yeah. help drop an RFP for somebody new. Okay. It takes a lot of. It just takes a lot of. You know, I get stuck on reappraisals. I get stuck on, you know, I get stuck on. Um, you know, tax sales, so it goes like four or five weeks before I get in touch with the engineer, and then it's kind of like, hey, have you, you know, right. have you gotten to where you need to be? Oh, gee, I haven't looked at it in four weeks. So, right. you know, um, without that, there be, you know, there's just too many other, this person's a whole lot more focused on the project than 
Sure. Then I would be. I, I understand that, and, and, and I think it's a valuable position. Um, and there's all sorts of levels of project managers, so there would have to be a discussion as to what what you're really looking for and what we can afford. Okay, so uh, what do we need to do with this? Just want to make sure everybody understands yep. where we're at, where we're going, the headwinds that are against us by doing this, and that. Um, by signing this, it's one step closer. We will still get a grant contract um, to sign, then it's, then it's official, but um, that we continue to move forward, but just understand the strings and, and the headwinds by doing this, but you know, ultimately it's $269,000 of somebody else's money, which I think is the benefit. Uh -huh. I mean, you may have already answered this, but number four in there says that we have a month to um, execute uh, to uh, obtain detailed proposed schedule once the design contract is executed. Is that, is that a doable thing? Well, we're kind of, yeah, so, well, again, let's back up, so yep. it'll be a month, month and a half before we get the contract. We'll send it in and, you know, it'll be, um, you know, another month, a month and a half, we can talk about the, the, the project manager, et cetera. Um, once that decision is made, then we go towards the engineering. Um, we're already at construction stage. So let's forget the utilities part of this. We check the utilities out. We've done everything that we need to do to get to this construction phase. So the timeline really is, okay, we go out to bid or we sub submit the M111 permit. The hiccups in that are the National Environmental Policy Act categorical exclusion and um, in order to get grant reimbursement for anything that the engineer does going forward to make sure that whatever we did when we hired him was done um, in a competitive manner. Um, I think once we get through that, I think that the supervisor will work us with us because we're unique and we're in a different place than 99% of the other applicants. will work with us as far as putting together a timeline that fits with where we're at and, and in, in the project that we've got at the moment. Do you need a motion for, for anything or not? Um, sure. I make a motion that we authorize David Ormiston to sign the project commitments form from the state of Vermont for the three corners intersection. I'll second the motion. Does it have to be like for the grant of two hundred sixty-nine thousand six hundred dollars, or? Um, I missed everything what he said, but I think it's a matter of um, allowing me to sign or uh, signing the project commitment form for the three corners intersection yeah, bike bed project. Can we take a break? I want no. to stand up. You can stand up. Can All right, well, I want to get That's more right. water, move around. We've been sitting for over two hours. Very unhealthy. We all need to hydrate. What? Want some water? I'm all set. Um, <laughs> Dreaming of a glass of wine, actually. I don't have any water. <laughs> Okay, everybody's good with that, right? Mary? What? Yes. You're good with that? Yes. Okay. okay so we should uh, move on to the uh, damages notes so we can get wind this up. Are we, are we going to this intersection, I believe, mm -hmm. for now? We're down, far from down. We're down from now. <laughs> 
So I got to say it was interesting because the consensus thing came up quite a bit tonight. But uh, so I, Mellis Cutney Prevention Partnerships has like regional meetings. So they talk, they have like a regional wellness thing. So they had one in um, Windsor last week. And I'm part of like building families group. And there's like, I don't know, like 15 of us. And I meant to bring it tonight, but so I'm sitting there and in my little packet, what they had was, remember the little sheets that Sarah Kobolinska gave us on consensus? Like the one through uh, 10? <laughs> yeah. So in there, they had the consensus sheet, one through 10. So I just thought I would, it is used. And in this group, before we move on, we have to signal whether we're like a one or a two or four is neutral. Anybody below four, then we stop. But uh, I just thought that was kind of cracking up. <laughs> Made by morning. Glad to know it works. Anyway. Especially for a big group like that, I can see. I, <laughs> I'm just saying it's, it, it worked. Yeah. I, I was humored to see it, that's all. That's great, Dave. It's good to be humored. I, uh, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I think um, highway department uh, the big thing there is. Can you um, ask about the delinquent taxes if you're going down the, the list? Um, sure. Uh, I just don't know how we're preparing or what we have to do for the Robert Blake property. I mean, our, our, the way, what responsibility do we have as a select board to be thinking about disposing, reselling that, or. Michael, yeah. Michael. Michael, Michael Blake, I'm sorry, yeah. So we will um, need to take legal action at some point to remove him from the premises. I assume that on November 15th, he will just not be gone. So we will need to take that step. Um, spoken to Robert Mammy about it uh, a little bit. Yep. Um, and um, what that would entail and what it was just some small chatter. Um, <coughs> he basically said, get back to him in November, um, and we'll have a more detailed discussion then. Okay. I think from there, I've heard um, differing points of view as to um, once that's resolved, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I've heard some talk about just simply putting a for sale sign on it and sell it as is, mm. or depending on what's there, um, we may need to remediate to some extent yeah. okay. so I think it's just a matter of you know I'm not sure we can make that judgment call until we were there okay okay but it'd be good to have some plan I think that that's there's a spectrum of a plan there so I uh, talked to uh, John Bassett about this a little bit and a couple other people, but um, you know, there's a thought process of, you know, that's, you know, a livable place for somebody um, and to simply put the for sale sign up and sell it as is. Um, it may very well be a point where that's not a doable thing and that may need to be pulled off the site. Um, there may be other things that we may feel socially obligated to remediate before we pass it on. Um, I, um, so I think that I have, at least I have mulled that process over my head. Everything from putting the for sale sign up to having to remediate to some extent. Um, okay. I've had, you know, some discussion, I'm sure a grant would be involved, but uh, some discussion with Two Rivers or a couple other people that, you know, how would you, you know, is there any, in there we would be looking probably for some funding somewhere. Is there any way to, you know, help fund that process? Um, and there's a lot of question marks on that one. So we go on a tax, another tax sale this year? Or we I don't think I'm going to tackle one until, um, I think I'll do 
I think I'm going to wait a year at this point in time um, for two reasons. This one, simply the work effort to put into it. But um, you weren't here the last meeting, but um, there are a few, you know, I'll call them heavy hitters left. There's some that uh, I was flipping through today. There's still 44 out there. So still a high number, but um, a number of these are, you know, $800 or less a year in tax money, which leads me to believe that it's a mobile home of some sort. That becomes tricky and, and not an easy thing to handle. It's not as, um, you, know, you, you may have good land underneath it, you know, or it's, you know, a questionable piece of land with a mobile home. Um, you know, what are we going to do with a mobile home? Are we going to sell them? You know, so the thought process is, is, you know, there has been, you know, I talked to Kevin uh, O'Toole a little bit about this. He said that, I forget the town, there was another town involved with a similar tax sale with a lot of mobile homes. They kind of set up a couple mobile home dealers or buyers before they did it. So I need to kind of think about, there's a little bit of thought needs to go into this one. Um, you know, the last one was more difficult than the first one, and I think this one may be, you know, it's, it's just going to be questionable um, as to how we may want to deal. i got to take a closer look at some of the properties. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Dave, um, getting back to the, the Blake property, um, what about the people? Uh, are we... Are we going to contact some social services or some someone that can help them if they have to relocate? Um, it's kind of up to the board. My answer is they've had a year to figure that out. I think yeah. there's been no effort made. I know that. I understand that. But uh, I, I think they're reluctant to... Uh, believe that's going to really, really going to happen. I don't think they're convinced. And so whether the year's gone by or not, I think it's going to hit them hard. And they probably need some help. A committee might be good for that. <laughs> I think that um, um, I think I'm going to pull this back and again this was part of my highway department conversation but I think that comes back to um, the present structure that you have with the town manager and supporting staff um, if you really want to be interested in and and providing support such as that I think you need to understand what you may need in place to be able to provide that um, and to think that with a lot of the situations that arise in town that we can provide offsetting support such as that I don't and believe me I'm not saying it's not I, I'm I sit in on I, I don't see town managers in any other of these meetings um, you know I seem to be kind of a you know, on the fringe on going to a lot of these um, wellness meetings, but mm -hmm. the more I go to them, the more I'm finding that there's an intertwining issues uh, in the Upper Valley, and that it is spread and shared by towns on both sides of the Connecticut River, and I'm shocked that, you know, it hasn't been really looked at. Though I understand Hartford just put together a committee on homelessness, but um, it is certainly a topic that is being discussed outside of the select board as to how to deal with some of these issues. But I think that it comes back to being able to follow through on what we would like to provide. And I think that that again comes down to what inputs do we need to put into the structure in order to get the desired outputs that we would like. And I think that that's really would be something that I think the select board really needs to, as I talk about this infrastructure and talk about this, I think that that, I know Mary, you like the details, but I think that that's truly an important concept that the select board 
really needs to kind of discuss and kind of get grapple with. Well, can you just tell me from your meetings? Yeah. Do other towns? What do they do? Do they have committees that wellness committees or whatever they call them? Well, Wake Park has two committees, but I don't think either committee has tackled an issue like this. What Heartland has what committees? Uh, Heartland Cares and oh, Heartland yeah. Municipal Resource Group. Uh, and then there's a third group, the Heartland Resiliency Group, which is not a, yeah, so they're, they're out there as well. But, but I towns. don't know, to, to your question, I don't believe they're tackling an issue like this. Right, so that's I'm just wondering if there are other towns in our area that have a dedicated committee to tackle these issues. I think that, um, Sarah may have an answer. That's a complicated <laughs> question, and the answer is yes, sometimes, and no. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a much more complicated question, and it would be worth um, a, a report at the select board meeting at some point um, in the future. This is, this is complicated because it has something to do with state structures yeah. and regional structures um, and local volunteerism, and there are layers in this, and so it's not a simple answer to it, um, but is there um, concern about this and, and work going on, and it's at the tables that, you know, I've been really impressed at the tables that Dave, I think, has really strategically chosen to sit at um, outside of town in this, in this regional effort to look at issues like this. Uh, and there are really concerns about social isolation of elders, and we have um, a third of our population here fit into that age category. Um, and, and then there are issues of poverty um, for a subsection of the population that overlay other kinds of issues and then how individual towns are dealing with that. It's varied. Um, and so there are lots of conversations going on, and it would be good to have it summed together and shared with this board at some point. And, and I speak in this way because this is sort of where I'm spending my life these days. No, go ahead with you. That one. <laughs> I don't know if we solved it, but <laughs> um, so essentially we're, we're working with FEMA, um, put together a lot of the cost estimates and um, a lot of that's been submitted or is being submitted or is being worked on. Um, I think that um, from that, uh, my understanding is is that Mace Hill culvert on Mace Hill Road, if you've been on that, which is kind of coned off at the moment, um, looks as though we will receive funding at a minimum to fix it, um, at best to upsize it to what the hydrology study comes back at is what it size it needs to be. But actually, let me be more direct. If the hydrology study says it needs to be bigger, um, it looks as though we'll build it bigger and they'll pay for it. If it looks as though it's going to be the same size, then it will be built at the same size and will carry on. So we're waiting on that hydrology study to come back. Um, the Jennyville culvert is not in the same boat. Um, FEMA won't cover it. It wasn't damaged during the actual storm. So there is, because this has caused problems with other storms, I believe that the state mitigation funding will cover that. Um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but this is kind of where I wanted to plug it. Um, but um, the, the, the work, the larger scale work that, um, you know, on the Three Corners Intersection project um, to carry through the uh, culverts and to make sure that that gets carried through and it gets done. Um, it will be grant work. Um, if this comes to fruition on Mace Hill, that's a potential $200,000 savings to the town. Um, if we go forward and we're successful at the Three Corners Intersection, that's 
$8,000 savings to the town. So again, it is difficult for me to carry through the large scale projects that truly need to be done, but save the town hundreds of thousands of dollars Try, it's difficult to offset that with the every daily, you know, small things that come up. So again, I'm not waging a magical wand. I, again, I'm going to come back to, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but just understand what may need to be in place or what doesn't need to be in place in order to be able to carry through that work. You know, what needs to be on my plate, what doesn't need to be on my plate. What needs to be on Bill's plate, what doesn't need to be on Bill's plate. You know, and you know, I think that the listers are semi okay, um, as is as a structure, and I think the finance office is working. But I think that um, the two major components would be um, the town manager's office and the highway department as to how things are working. And shouldn't surprise anybody that's where we spend most of our money and um, do most of our work is through my office and through the, the highway department. Um, Buildings and grounds is certainly in there, um, which kind of flows through my office, um, kind of a whole separate issue. But um, again, I'm just, as we work on things and we look back at what we've done and what we need to do forward, small things compared to big things, how that's done, who does it, et cetera. Just, I think it's important for the select board, I'm gonna say it's probably the most important thing. Phil, I would almost say that if we can go back in time, you know, before a roads committee, I would almost say looking at the structure and how we do things in town might be, you know, a better place to start because ultimately I think some of that is going to come back to that question. Mm -hmm. I think it's just something that as we raise questions of how about this, can we do that, understand what we need to put into it to get out, get, get it done. That being said, Fort Brook Road may be back on our plate. I got an email over the holiday weekend stating that he would like us to consider acceptance of Fort Brook Road. Oh, um, <laughs> um, Schedule it. I expect that will be on the... Um, I know, I'll just deny it. It is what it is. Next meeting. Uh, last thing I'm going to say is that uh, Lowell's Brook uh, out behind the rec center was damaged uh, or had um, erosion to the stream bank on our property. Um, uh, talking with FEMA and the Connecticut River Conservancy and to the state of Vermont, um, Scott Jensen, planting in that area it seems to be the um, most highly recommended antidote to that. Right now it's mainly, I'm talking about the corner um, the, the bike path kind of goes in a corner and then kind of walks it's behind both the library and the rec center towards Candace Jones's property. Um, kind of out back behind the 21 house, that mm -hmm. kind of area along Wells Brook is kind of open field, but we'll probably need to seed like 30, 35 yards worth of some of that field there. Um, it's kind of a natural buffer and it will help stabilize that to an extent. Um, not overly expensive. Connecticut River Conservancy has already got grant money to do. They're already planting back there. We're just going to kind of add it on. But um, mm -hmm. What it, are they planting? I don't I have to ask Conservation Committee. I don't know what they're planting. So um, what was there, flooding there? Uh, in this so in, in this area, um, if nobody's been back there, uh, Wells Brook eroded the stream bank towards the um, walking path. So there is a small bench in that area, and it's eroded essentially right up to the bench. The bench almost got taken away. Um, and it will continue to erode probably back to where we want to put the planting over the course of several springs. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of planting that area to kind of stabilize it. And, um, and, I, and I think you're right. I think the Planning Commission has had this on their agenda and there's been some walkthroughs. Yep. Um, because Candace's name has come up as to what we're gonna do with that tree and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know. Um, 
they have done, as my understanding, they've been planting back there for, I don't know, the last 10, five, eight years anyways. And Shroud Unlimited has been also trying to help okay. as well. I, I thought that was, I didn't realize it was an every year thing. I, I remember when they did a ma pretty major planting, they had a plant yeah. and all that, but I didn't know it was every year. You know, it's been, they've done something back there, whether it's on our land or somebody else's land along that corridor. Mm -hmm. Since I've been here, they've done something every summer. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, they're, other than this part, what I asked them to look at was this piece right there. This year, they were down more in between the two snowmobile bridges, more down towards the fire station, mm -hmm. behind the fire station property. They've been kind of looking at that. So it's been the whole Wellsbrook area. But um, if it, we don't do something over the course of several years, it'll recede back that far anyways. So I think the idea is, you know, put some plantings in and try and stabilize mm -hmm. it. Do we do it or they are doing it? They will do the planting. So what do we have to do? Nothing. Just kind of telling you. Oh. We, uh, we may go in and there is a log kind of, um, um, there's a log that is kind of at a funky dimension. Um, upon the state of Vermont's recommendation, we may just cut it. Mm -hmm. He just basically said cut it and let it fall into there. Basically, four to six feet segments. He said it'll get washed down the stream in the springtime, um, or will move. Um, he said basically cut it and let it drop. Uh, was his response, and this it'll is cut up. It will clog up a culvert downstream. Who is this guy? It's habitat for trout. He's uh, it's a positive thing. Uh, he's actually the stream alteration guy. So he's. <laughs> He's a stream guy. But anyway, he seemed to think that the movement of the water, and these would be small logs compared to what's actually in the river, but yeah. um, he said the actual movement would alleviate it better than the way it's laying now. Is yeah. kind of what yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dave, I'm, yeah. um, I, I was sad to see the email that we are losing our greater operator. Um, I lost track of someone was going to get feedback, one of the staff was feedback on the state of their knee or the state of something and whether they were going to return to work. So I guess my question is, who's working and who's not right now? Bill went on vacation as of today for through the end of the week. BJ is back. Um, Zach has been with us, hasn't gone anywhere. Um, Doug is still working, kicking around. Okay. Um, Skip is the one that has let us know that he's moving on to Cornish. Okay. When will that be? Uh, September 13th. Oh. Two weeks from, two weeks from mm -hmm. Friday. Uh, and we still have Zach Wood, who we've been using on Fridays, who we will, and based upon Skip's moving on, we'll probably keep him hanging around for the foreseeable future. He's only a Friday kind of fill-in guy. Okay. Basically moves material for us. Um, does Zach have a CDL? He does. Pre-employment drug test as well, um, that kind of stuff. So he's basically, you know, for payroll purposes, considered an employee. Um, no, no, the others are the town employees. Oh, day. oh, I'm sorry. So Zach is scheduled. Thanks for I meant to put that in there. Zach is scheduled to get his CDL. I want to say within two weeks. I say that to be conservative. I think it's he's got a walk around refresher on. I think the tomorrow fourth. I want to say, and then a week or two, he actually has his test. What is his last name? Wow, I can't remember. Zach. And are we working some overtime shifts? Because I followed the tractor down on the Harden Coochie Road there at five ish. On the cutting, we are. Okay. Actually, this all last week we did because um, we've been hauling sand mm -hmm. uh, in an effort to, to make it. Uh, 
sufficient for D&D, &D, but also to try and move that to free us back up to, I mean, other than Zach, uh, who's off roadside mowing, um, you know, when we move sand, all the trucks are tied up. So we'd like to try and get through that so we can get back to just normal um, maintenance. So, and I suspect that um, um, given the, lawn, the roadside mowing that, um, yes, Zach will probably work uh, an extra hour a day anyways um, mm -hmm. to, to speed that up. Okay. Is that it? Has anybody got any can bring up this? That's about ready? ten things. <laughs> I've got nothing. I just wanted to see your face fall. <laughs> okay. So she toys around with you too. Good thing I'm not the only person. Jeez, gross. She doesn't have anyone at home tonight to harass. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so we're done. Did you see um, Jim Kenyon in the building? Yes.